Great, let's start. I'm very happy to announce Padma Srinivas uh, from Boston University, and she will tell us about periodic analog metrics, periodic heights, and rational points of course. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, or to all of you for being here. Uh, before the actual talk, I have a 20 second commercial ad. <laughs> um, I'm, I know several people here think about modified diagonal cycles. So some of us are organizing a workshop in May at ISM around uh, the Teresa cycle. It's uh, the week of May 13th to 17th. So if you're interested or if you know graduate students or postdocs who might be interested, please do let them know. That's the end of the ad. <laughs> The actual talk, I think, yeah, Bogdan has told me that I actually submitted a different title. Um, so this talk is around uh, um, a few different ideas, but motivation comes from trying to understand rational points and curves and how periodic heights uh, play a role in computing rational points. Right? So, um, so let me set the stage uh, by introducing the problem we want to think about. So we are given, uh, so the introduction, let me say, I have a nice curve uh, over the rational. For me, nice is a technical term, so smooth projective geometrically integral. Um, and let's say its genus is bigger than one. And the goal, <laughs> is to try and compute the set of rational solutions, try to compute Yeah. Uh, how do we want to do this? Like, Fordings' theorem uh, tells us that when the genus is bigger than one, this set of rational points, this is a finite set, there are finitely many solutions with rational coordinates, but uh, it's ineffective. It does not give you a bound of the size of the largest solution. You might imagine if you have reasonably small bounds, you can just search through all rational numbers up to some bounded height and actually find all rational solutions, but um, Paul thinks this plot does not give, give you this. So uh, you but look for other methods. Currently, just for the number of x q, as far as I remember, there is, it's more effective just to know it down for the number, but not the height. Uh, not the height, exactly. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so, so you, yeah. You look for other methods that might uh, maybe don't work in full generality, but let you handle, uh, let, let you actually find the set of rational points. So a method that's been particularly successful is the Sherwood-T. Coleman method. And that works um, when you, the model we rank of the Jacobian is small. So, um, so let me introduce more characters in the story. So J is the Jacobian of your curve X. And let's say we're not in the silly situation. There are no points. There are lots of methods for ruling out the existence of rational points. And let's say there's at least one. Um, uh, so you can't use your method uh, for ruling out rational points, the existence of rational points. And you use this to embed your curve inside the Jacobian. So something x, to x minus b. And the Shabbat Coleman method works when the model we rank of the Jacobian is small. So R here is the rank of J of Q. We know this is a finitely generated abelian group. Um, so the Shabbat Coleman method, it's a periodic method for rational points that works in the generic case when you have low rank. Most of the time we expect rank to be small, either zero or one. And th this method is particularly Effective in showing that the set of rational points that you have is complete. So how does it work? It looks uh, for the set of rational points inside the larger set of periodic points on the curve. And uh, so where so you have you have this periodic analytic curve, you draw a cartoon, something like this, and you have you have a finite set of points somewhere on this curve. So how might you go looking for where these rational points are? We want to look for something special about where these points are situated. Um, you might realize that the rational points in the curve also sit inside the rational points of the Jacobian. Um, so Shabbat's insight was to say, okay, let's look for 
uh, look at, po at points that lie in the intersection, embed the curve inside, inside the Jacobian, and see if the, the see if the rational points line up along some special analytic subvariety. Um, so a natural thing that you might try and put in is is the closure of the set of rational points. Uh, closure of the Piaget topology of the set of rational points on the Jacobian, and when the rank is less than the genus, the dimension uh, of this um, of this closure is less than the ambient dimension, dimension J. So this is like some kind of analytic subvariety, and you look for the rational points in the intersection. So you um, so you slice this analytic curve with this analytic subvariety. This was uh, Shevardy's idea, and you can show that this intersection is finite. Coleman actually turned this into an effective method for looking for these solutions. So you look for functions that actually cut out this PID closure. So uh, Coleman showed that this, this locus is actually um, cut out by uh, the zeros of a Coleman analytic function, this F here. Know about the analytic function. So this just concretely means in each residue disk of the curve, you have a nice uh, a convergent power series whose zero locus contains uh, your set of rational points. Okay, so so uh, yes, inequality is not strict. The NJQ bar less no. Sorry, power. sorry. Yes, thank you. It may drop, but like yeah, it's it could be the whole thing. In the reality, it's a good P to select for. Ah, great question. So, do you need any assumptions on the kind of prime you can use? Um, uh, if you do, you need P to be a prime of good reduction. Uh, not necessary. There is a generalization of this method. You just change the type of function you look at. You can you can look at um, this method works also when P is a bad prime, but. Uh, you just have to be careful about what kind of analytic functions you're looking at. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a more general in, uh, theory of integration, um, and you just look at analytic functions that, that are one of God's analytic. Great. Uh, but great question. I hope you'll ask me this again in a few minutes uh, where I try and uh, generalize this method. Okay, so, so the Shabbat Coleman method is very successful in the low rank situations so when the rank is less than the genus. Uh, so the question today is what about what do you do when you can't use Shevardy's method? What happens when the rank is bigger than or equal to the genus? This is quite often the situation for things like modular curves, um, which typically tend to have rank a multiple of the genus. So for instance, uh, the method I'm about to describe, let me give an explanation for like uh, works well, for instance, Ah, and finding all rational points in this particularly interest, interesting curves in nature tend to have high rank. So things like modular curves where rank is a multiple of the genus. So I split, yeah? Except what? Yes. Split, split, split cut down modular curve of, of uh, yeah, 13. Uh, so this was the last remaining curve uh, in, in uh, so, if you're trying to classify elliptic curves with a particular type of Galois representation, you classify them based on the image ty type of um, subgroup um, uh, the image of Galois looks like. And this was the last remaining level. If you look at uh, Galois uh, elliptic curves with Galois representations containing a split Cartan um, subgroup, and uh, there's a generalization of Shevardy's method that. Is particularly uh, it's particularly well suited to uh, understanding rational points on things like modular curves, where the rank may be bigger than or equal to the genus, but you have additional geometric structure to play with. So these modular curves have um, lots of correspondences on them, and you try and use this additional geometric input in some way. So um, um, to try and understand the set of rational points, and that's that's what the quadratic Shevardy method does. Why quadratic? I'll tell you in a little bit. Um, 
So what the quadratic, I'll give you the output of the quadratic Shavati method and then we'll uh, try to understand it a little bit better. So what the quadratic Shavati method gives you is an explicitly computable like before a function on the periodic points of the curve that's also uh, locally analytic in the Coleman or what right here. Here. Our curve is a cheap problem. I'm sorry? What do you want here? Uh, where, uh, for applying this quadratic Shepherdy method, you need the rank. Uh, this works particularly well when the rank is bigger than or equal to the genus and the rank of the neuron severity group of the Jacobian is larger than one. So typically, someone, not you forward. Yeah, uh, thank you. Sorry, I've been, yes, thank you so much for pointing out all my inequalities today. I've been like putting inequal, uh, strict inequalities in the wrong places. You, when you have additional correspondences to play with, which is the situation in modular curves, which have lots of um, Hecker correspondences. <coughs> the generic situation, most of the varieties, you don't have extra, extra line bundles to play with, but for uh, modular curves, you do. Um, and this, this method works well under these hypotheses. And what it gives you, uh, like before, it gives you uh, uh, a locally analytic function in the Coleman or Wolowski sense um, that has, that is not constant in each residue disk. So it, it has, if you fix a value, there are only finitely many um, points on the curve, which take a particular value. And where do you look for the rational points? You look for the rational points on sorry, finitely many level sets for this function. There's some beautiful finite set. Um, finite set of values such that the rational points are contained inside uh, level sets for this function. Okay, um, so this, this first condition um, is really saying that this function is non-constant needs to resonate disk. I call this the QC1 condition and um, second one, QC2. Um, so the question I want to try uh, and answer in today's talk is to try and explain where these functions come from. Questions. analytic functions and this, I mean, is finitely many values, where do they come from? Uh -huh. And what is the role played by this additional line bundle on the Jacobian? Okay, so um, the a couple of answers to this. So the first uh, first instance of quadratic Shepherd for rational points, uh, the first explanation was given by uh, my colleague, Jennifer Balakrishnan and Nathan Dogra in 2016, and uh, they were motivated by an extension of uh, the shabuti coleman method that goes by the non-abelian shabuti kim method, where you generalize, you again try to find the rational points inside the periodic points, but uh, the idea is when the rank equals the genus or when the rank's bigger than the genus, the Jacobian's too small a space to embed the curve, and you try to embed it in larger spaces, and you try and implement a similar uh, kind of picture, um, but uh, in practice, um, it's kind of indirect how you use, you start with some straightforward geometric input, this uh, additional line bundle on the Jacobian, but you pass it, you use that line bundle in some non-trivial way, you use it to construct a certain mixed extension of color representations, which has a certain height associate, associated to it, so you use Nequar heights of mixed extension of certain valor representations constructed. Constructed from, from a nice 
line model L. And in practice, so I've been saying explicitly computable in a bunch of places, but this, these are actually pretty hard to write down explicitly. So for stars here, um, actually getting your hands on, on this function requires uh, being able to describe uh, these mixed extension of Galois representations in some concrete way in practice. It, you have to do some ex very explicit non abelian PR records theory. You have to describe um, end up having to describe okay. things that appear in PR records theory, which you hope you never have to write down in like gory detail. But this, this is this is um, this is what the first uh, this is the first explanation for why this method works, and uh, it's part of this larger program by Shabuti and Kim. Um, but the question remains, like, given that you're starting with some very concrete geometric data, you must be able to explain this function without um, uh, using just geometry, right? So uh, another explanation uh, for where these functions come from was given by Eric Hoven and Lido in 2021, and they uh, they, their goal, they, they titled their paper Geometric Quadratic Shabuti, and they said their goal is to make quadratic Shabuti small and geometric again and not uh, use, use the line bound on a more direct fashion. And what they did, again, I'll draw a picture, uh, instead of embedding the curve inside the Jacobian, you embed it in, um, you embed it in this torsor over the Jacobian coming from the total space of a line bundle. So you have um, you have this ex extra line bundle to play with. So you have one extra dimension. So what they do is they embed this. This is non-proper variety. So it's a zero section. This is like a GM torsor over G. And they embed the rational points in the curve. You choose suitable integral models. You embed it inside uh, and like the points of this torsor in this one, one higher dimension, and that's good enough. But in practice, in um, what this needs, uh, and and you constrain where where the where the image lies in in a similar in a similar fashion. And in practice, what this needs is being able to describe analytic coordinates on this torsor explicitly that you can then restrict to the curve. So it means. T and uh, respect respect to your curve, right? Um, so what I'm going to tell you today is uh, so T is the total strength of this uh, line bundle, additional line bundle. You uh, you choose a line bundle, and all of these, um, what having extra neuron severity rank buys you is you're, you're able, you can choose, you can choose uh, a line bundle on pig G that's non zero, it's class it, that such that the class of the line bundle um, is non trivial in the neuron severity of the Jacobian, but when you pull it back, To the curve, it becomes a trivial bundle. So choosing this trivialization kind of gives you um, gives you this embedding. Um, Today, I want to give you a third explanation, third way of thinking about where these functions come from. And our, our motivation came from trying to give, I mean, given how complicated these gadgets are to describe concretely, we want, I mean, having alternate ways of describing these functions, our hope is eventually to be able to do more, uh, do these uh, computations for a larger collection of curves 
Um, so this is this is the main. Uh, here for today so far, I thought um, we will, I will give you uh, my, my original title had something about uh, canonical heights on uh, abelian varieties. So I give you a new construction of canonical chaotic heights. Right functions and use that to explain uh, that show you that these functions are actually quite natural. Um, it's, it's a surprise that um, that these things show up. So what we do, so uh, more precisely, as I'm going to fill in details as I go on. What we're going, to, uh, what I'm going to tell you today is for uh, each uh, line bundle, on the Jacobian I give you uh, need for constructing periodic heights. You typically have to make some auxiliary choices, um, unlike. Real value heights and don't take heights. All you need is a line model for defining height function. For periodic heights, you need to make some auxiliary choices. I will I will describe what they are when I get there. But um, we will I will define um, canonical height function. So this is going to be a QP valued function on on the rational points of the Jacobian okay. such that if you if you choose if you choose a line bundle that's non-trivial. I think I just wrote this there. I got a little ahead of myself. But if you choose a line bundle that's non-trivial, the neuron severity of the Jacobian, but that's tricks, but pulls back to the trivial bundle on the curve, then this function that cuts out the rational points is um, Directly constructed from the periodic height of the associated line bundle. So you take uh, the global periodic height. So, okay, I have to, a priori, it's first just defined on the rational points of the Jacobian, but um, I, have, I have to explain how this extends to the periodic points, but there's a natural extension. And the function that cuts out the rational points is the difference of the global height minus the local height uh, at P. And so I need to evaluate um, these local heights. They're defined, their functions defined on the total space of the line bundle. So I have to choose a section, but when the line bundle, uh, the restriction of the line bundle to the curve is trivial, there's a natural section to play with, which I call one. So evaluate. So I take the difference between the global height and the local height at P. Um, this extends. Um, to a Coleman or Ologotsky function, analytic function, F or X of QP uh, that satisfies Satisfies the two conditions that you hope are true for running quadratic geometry. That satisfies exclusively one this condition of having finite fibers of being non constant in each residue disk uh, is directly guaranteed from this assumption that um, line bundles non trivial in the non severity. Um, spirit into the construction. HLP. It's it's um, so I will I will I have to describe I have to the whole point of the talk is to try and define each of these so this is I'm, I'm going to give you a construction of a global height this is going it comes with a local decomposition 
This is the local piece at P. Um, it's, it's a function on the periodic points of the Jacobian. Just like the Neuronte types, when you choose a section, it has a local decomposition. Um, uh, the construction, uh, yeah, it comes by, the global height is constructed in terms of uh, these local heights that keep a different. Um, so these two conditions that you impose on the line bundle directly uh, imply the two conditions that you want. So my goal for today is to uh, give outline for you a construction of these chaotic heights uh, for Jacobians. Um, but okay, but even to make sense of this, maybe I have to tell you a little bit more. So, um, so what do I mean by a canonical height function? So uh, canonical here is used in a sense similar to what we used to for the Dante heights. What makes this height function canonical is how it interacts with the group law on the Jacobian. So if 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 you start with a line bundle that's symmetric, this construct this canonical height I'm going to construct for you will be a quadratic function, then HL, when you multiply the point, add the point to itself n times, the height scales by a factor of n squared, HLP. Uh, if, if you start with an anti-symmetric line bundle, then the associated height, canonical height, It's linear, and in general, you get some kind of quadratic function. Well, you can um, the square of any line bundle. Symmetric means that the pullback of the line bundle under minus one, which is the other operation in the Jacobian, is isomorphic to the original bundle. So this is isomorphic. And asymmetric is L inverse. In general, you can decompose the square of any line bundle into a symmetric piece and an anti symmetric piece and the associated heights. Um, so in, in, in general, you get quadratic function. Something is pure quadratic and something you know. So just like in the non date heights. Um, the other thing that maybe I have to uh, tell you is like um, how to interpret this global. The local heights are naturally functions that are defined uh, on the completions, but the global height a priori is only defined on the rational points of the Jacobian, but this is where we use the rank equals genus hypothesis um, and this canonicity. So um, the assumption that the rank equals the genus uh, means that you have a particularly nice basis for the space of quadratic functions on J of Q. We can expand um, quadratic functions on J of Q uh, using single integrals of holomorphic differentials. So I'm using, oh, I wrote on the wrong board. This does, oh no, it doesn't. Using products of single integrals. So The, the integrals of holomorphic one-forms give you a nice basis for linear functions on J of Q, and if you take products of them, you get a nice basis for quadratic functions, and these, these functions are not just defined uh, on the rational points, they extend to all periodic points on the K. Okay, so that's how you interpret this global guy, and I have to tell you what, how these local, uh, my main goal is to outline the construction of these different functions. Um, any other questions? So maybe I should tell you why. So those are like iterated integrals or what? 
Uh, these are not iterated. These are products of single integrals. Thank you. This local height at t, this will be an iterated chaotic integral. So, okay. Why did we want to do this given that there are already other explanations uh, for quadratic shape out there? So we had, like I said, a few different uh, reasons for wanting to do this. Um, so there are like, let's say that this is, there are lots and lots of constructions of periodic fights in, in the literature. Um, we're the first ones to try and do this. So there are various constructions of periodic height settings. So, uh, Schneider. Made the I mean, there's an abundance of constructions um, all working under different hypotheses that coincide to make the right kind of auxiliary choices. Nekowar's height, which I already explained, and the Kulmis here also has a construction that works uh, without any assumption to the reduction type. So there are lots and lots of constructions of periodic heights in the literature. Um, oh. What are some, uh, why would you want another, why would you want to throw in another one into the list? Uh, our reason for this is, um, is to construct chaotic heights um, in a manner analogous to the construction of neurontine heights, some feeding features of, of, of a new, new construction. So, um, there was already a question earlier about carrying out whether there are any uh, assumptions on uh, the type of plan P you use. Uh, one way, one thing that our approach to quadratic Shabati does is the way it's set up, it naturally works also for bad primes. Uh, you just replace the kind of integrals you look at instead of looking at Coleman integrals, you look at Volokotsky integrals, so it's just an extension of Coleman integration. Bad times. It also works. If, I mean, uh, for the introduction, I said pick x over q, but like there is uh, no such restriction. This this general framework also works for thirds over number fields. Um, but our main motivation was to construct, give a construction of periodic heights that more closely parallels uh, the construction of denotate heights, real valued heights. So this uh, you see as I as I give you the definition more cl closely parallel Young's construction of um, uh, they don't take heights from a dialect metric. So that was the fact that I think now they don't take heights. Canonical heights from a dialect matrix. Um, but maybe our real secret goal, we haven't done this yet, we're still working on it, is to use this uh, alternate way of thinking about periodic heights to give um, a new construction, new way to compute local heights away from P. So um, this also shows up in Professor Kornis' book. Um, so it, it kind of reveals some con interesting Connections between QP valued heights for different times P, which we are hoping to exploit for explicit computations um, for, for different P. Uh, and the hope is to actually turn this into a actual algorithm, new periodic uh, approach. Of computing mm -hmm. 
including um, local contributions even to like gravity heights. Uh, Monical, their value drives in the gravity heights um, at finite places. Somehow, being able to do these iterated periodic integrals is all you need if you also want to extract uh, the local contributions at places away from P. So this is kind of a vague statement now, but I'm hoping at the end of the talk, I'll be able to give you a more precise statement. But the goal is to try and use this connection to um, explicitly compute um, the goal. You could go with the use test. Um, explicitly compute. The, the, um, the set T that showed up at the beginning, the rational points where the, and the level sets are of some the scientific function. Um, and what, I mean, our, our, our compu explicit computations so far have been restricted to curves with particularly simple reduction types. The first applications for quadratic Chevrolet, for instance, work for curves which had potential good reduction at the edge. And in and, and those situations, you can actually just look for the rational points inside the zero locus of this analytic function. In general, like being able to, uh, if you if you work with curves and more complicated reduction types, what you end up having to do is uh, having to understand the high local heights away from P and uh, uh, what values they would take on rational points, and uh, being uh, being explicitly able to compute uh, the values of these local heights is what directly goes into uh, um, the recipe for what, where to look for national points. Okay. If we are pause here, yeah, please, please uh, thank you so much for your questions. Please ask me some more. Okay. Take a little break. Thank you. My goal for the rest of the talk is to outline, outline this construction. So the main main player in our story that, that appears in our construction of periodic heights is uh, this uh, invariant called the curvature form of a line bundle. Uh, so but, uh, we're going to piece together periodic height from uh, by giving metrics at each place of your number. It's a periodic idyllic metrics. Yeah, right. So for this, we're going to look, work locally. So fix a place, find that place of your number field. Okay. Um, and let's say you have the right, of ID. And you have, you have a line model. P. Um, so places away from P, what shows up is very similar to what shows up in the rotate heights. Um, so if you fix a V different from P, uh, you the ingredient that goes into this idyllic metric is a Q-valued function on the total space of a line bundle. So Q-valued metric on L. This is this is going to be a locally constant function, locally constant for the viadic topology, locally constant function, a way of measuring sizes of sections of line bundles on, on the total space of a line bundle minus this zero section. We're going to look for something that's Q-valued. Eventually, we want to build something that's QP-valued. So for places away from P, we restrict to things that are Q-valued. And uh, if you want this to be something on this portion of uh, not any old function it, it when you scale along the fibers 
uh, the function changes by the valuation, the adic valuation of the constant. And you'll be constant function such that uh, of alpha times w, you choose some constant, non zero constant, and you pick a vector in the fiber. Here, here you have uh, the total space of your line bundle, you delete as a zero section, and you take the vector, take some vector in the fiber above some point, W cross. If you scale that vector by a constant, you want this function to uh, change by the valuation of that constant. Alpha plus W for all, for all choices of constants and vectors. All right, so there are lots of examples of these uh, later. Okay, maybe I don't write all the way on the other side. So examples, you get such q-valued functions, q-valued metrics by looking at uh, the arise from integral models of uh, uh, of your variety and a line bundle. You spread out everything uh, over the ring of integers, and you do some intersection theory. So I won't write this out in detail. But uh, model metrics, and uh, you also get things like this from admissible metrics by evaluating functions. On, on the trivial bundle, you can evaluate functions and take take the norm. So, um, uh, exactly. But the new interesting piece um, is what the metrics look like at places above p. So this is where this integrated periodic iterated mode will show up. Oh, or don't use the same sort. This is like that. So for, for places above P for defining periodic heights, you typically have to make some auxiliary choices. So for us, uh, the main thing is we make a choice that's similar to uh, what shows up and at places above infinity in the on eight height. So you need to fix something called a curvature form for a line bundle. So what is this? This is uh, for us, it's, it's maybe similar to what shows up at places above infinity, but for us, it's not a one one form, it's a, it's a cohomology class. Um, So this, this is a cohomology class that lives in global global differentials, each not make a one tensor, each one that up. Um, but it's not any old any old uh, uh, cohomology class. It's something that has to map. It's a lift of the Chern class of the line bundle under the cup product map. Okay, so this is the this is the additional the additional ingredient and um, one one feature of our construction is like choosing these curvature forms at each place above p somehow encode all the information about periodic heights for all primes. So uh, this is a choice. Um, it, it, let me give you an example before I tell you how you use this. So for, um, you have a nice curve as before. Nice QC curve. Then um, here's a curvature form for the tangent bundle. Just to show that uh, the choices we make, it can be matched up with choices that appear in other constructions of periodic heights. You end up having to split um, the Hodge filtration. So you you choose okay, you choose a basis for sorry for global holomorphic differentials. And you choose a complementary uh, stop space. So you choose a dual basis, omega one bar, omega g bar, dual basis under the cup product pairing, i.e., make i bar plus j is delta ij. Then there's an example of a curvature form. The curvature form for the tangent bundle 
is, is um, um, it's supposed to be a homology class that lives in global differentials tensor each one around. So you take these holomorphic differentials, it's a homology class. That do of the dual okay. So the key in our construction is, is to take this cohomology class and use it to build a, a, a periodic analytic function um, again on the total space of a line bundle instead of a locally constant function. At, which you get from places away from P. Now you have something that's genuinely um, interesting. So the key here, key for getting the local heights at P is, is uh, this construction that shows up by collaborator and on Bess's paper, like a theoretic theory from 2005, where he, um, Shows that for such a, such a curvature form, you can associate as a, a canonically associated uh, function um, metric, i.e., a function she calls suggestively suggests uh, calls a log function. So this is. Now, instead of a locally constant function, you get a Coleman or Wologotsky analytic function on the total space of the line bundle minus the zero section. And again, fiber by fiber, it has a certain scaling property that satisfies satisfies when you scale scale in the fiber, um, the value changes. Um, by the periodic log of a constant. So secretly you fix the choice of periodic logarithm behind the scenes. And uh, when you scale along the fiber, you, you the value changes by this periodic log so for all draws um, the fiber and this this uh, and of periodic log and the relationship. He actually, um, what he does in this paper is define a periodic analog of the del bar operator that shows up in complex ge geometry. And this association is a, is a by relation that's similar uh, to what we used to this. I, I won't have time to define what this is, but it's the, um, the kernel of the del bar operator uh, singles out holomorphic functions amongst all. Uh, um, Global holomorphic sections amongst all analytic sections. So there's the simulation that looks like the that bar log is is the curvature form. Um, so I'm I'm not explaining this. Say that it's seen non date heights before and like local local heights at our comedian places. There is a similar thing. That shows up, and um, but one thing that's different here is um, okay. Maybe I just okay. Maybe I think I accidentally set up this log function on this metric is uh, determined by uh, the curvature form. That's not quite true, but it's almost true. The the association, the way to go, if you, someone hands you. A curvature form. There are like uh, multiple associated log functions. This is not unique, like unlike uh, real-valued situations. But like it's not, it's not, it's not terrible. If you have a different log function, is another. If you have a different log function that satisfies a similar relation, um, there's another log log function. With the same curvature form. Then the difference is something you understand very well. Um, it's the pullback of a function from the base. It's it's the integral of a holomorphic form on the base. Then log 
not time. When it's log, it's like the integral of some form. And this non uniqueness of, of this log function associated with curvature form is something that's actually key in our construction uh, we, that we will exploit later. Okay, so that's one remark. And the other remark is, uh, is to explain this connection with the adequate rate integrals. If at the end of the day you want to write down concrete analytic functions, you want formulas for these log functions. Uh, so, if, for instance, if if your um, if your variety if you have a line bundle um, over the Jacobian of the curve, and you have an explicit description of of the curvature form. Um, it looks like this. For instance, if you're on a modular curve, uh, this curvature form is something that you can directly compute from how, say, uh, say the line model is associated to a Hecker correspondence. This curvature form encodes the same data as how the correspondence acts on the Ram cohomology. It's, um, it's equivalent. Um, if your curvature form has this shape, then um, this log function, if you compose this with a section your line bundle, it's given by some iterated integral that you can compute from this expression. Uh, so this, you may see, like has nothing to do with the section, but like you, uh, you have to correct this uh, uh, by the integral of some meromorphic differential where I think of this as Correction, correction term, metamorphic differential, differential of second kind. Um, correct that corrects for the. At the end of the day, this is supposed to be an analytic function. It's not supposed to have zeros or poles. And uh, this thing, this correction form, clears out all the zeros and poles and uh, corrects for the singularities, zeros and poles of S. Die. So you set up an explicit remainder of problem and you can solve for these data assets. So I've told you what the little pieces at each place look like. So a periodic dynamic metric is this data of a Q value, Q value in metric at places away from P and these log functions at places above P. Here's the definition. So, um, yeah, like metric. Meta is like bundle. Uh, is, um, line bundle, but for a variety of the global field is, is a connection. Uh, is connection is above. Collection of uh, Q valued metrics at places away from P, not divided by P, and the analytic objects are these log functions at places dividing P. Some conditions you want, uh, and almost so you want all of these to be Q valued. Okay, that's, that is part of my definition. For, for almost every place, you want these to come from a model, a cycle model, for almost. Every days. Um, and these uh, log functions have to be chosen uh, compatibly, compatible with um, an Adele class. Act. The other ingredient that shows up in Piatica, its main thing is the curvature form, but you also need um, a way of sticking together these rational numbers together. So you need. Uh, There's a choice of middle class character involved, um, which is the substitute for the product formula. So, compatible with. The associated periodic heights. So, if you have this periodically metric line bundle, um, 
is section. Add a function. So for one side, write down all the choices involved. So you choose the asymmetrics at each place. So you're going to indicate the choice by bar. You choose these curvature forms by placing away from P. You choose the Sidel class character. If you want to evaluate this at, uh, at your favorite point in A of K, so if you have X and A of K, you choose a section that does not vanish. Choose a section of your line bundle above this point, the non-vanishing section that doesn't have a zero or a four. Um, the, the value that comes out will be independent of the section. Um, just like just like in the rotate heights, the product formula, you can write down the height, global height by choosing a section, but at the end, the answer doesn't depend on what section you write down. Um, you sum up these Q valued metrics at places away from P and the Sidel class character is like a glue. You scale this by the value of the Sidel class character at a uniformizer. And at places above P, you take uh, these log functions um, of the line bundle at the section. So this might be something in KV, you place it down to QP. This is, this is the main definition of the talk. This is the periodic height associated to a periodically metrized line bundle, uh, and it depends on these oxidative choices. Um, okay, I have two minutes, so maybe I, I should. Yeah, I tell you why. So the left yes. side doesn't depend on the choice of S. Yeah, for, yes. it's in, for any choice of S, this is independent. Exactly. Left hand side is independent. Local decomposition depends, uh, you need to choose a, a choice section, but the left hand side is independent of choice of S. And the independence, if you scale your section by a constant, uh, if, if you stare this carefully, what comes out is the value of the ideal class character at that constant, and that's zero. So this is. So in my last one minute, uh -huh, I'm going to tell you how you actually construct uh, such a thing. Um, a very brief section construction. And remember, I want uh, not any old uh, metric. I want to construct the canonical metric. Uh, I want my global height to be a quadratic function so I can expand it in my nice basis for quadratic functions. So the three, uh, so here's, here's a very brief sketch. Um, the, main, the main idea is instead of doing this line bundle by line bundle, you just metrize the mother of all line bundle, the Poincare bundle, it suffices to canonically metrize the Poincare bundle on, on X. You can, every other bundle is pull back of the Poincare bundle and you can pull back metrics. Um, and for places above P, which is where all this interesting bed is and where the curvature form plays a role, um, you want a canonical log function. Uh, and for this, you really exploit this non-uniqueness. You exploit non-uniqueness of this association. You pick, you start by picking some arbitrary one Choose any, choose any log function. Maybe it's not canonical, it doesn't play well with the group law, but you can adjust it, add to it. Uh, by an appropriate integral of a homomorphic form to make a new log function that does uh, log prime L such that time L uh, is four times. 
So i.e. this, this, the Poincare bundle is symmetric. So there is some isomorphism, pullback of the Poincare bundle by two eh, with the fourth power of the Poincare bundle. If you pick some random log function, both sides there are induced log functions for the pullback by two and the fourth tensor power, maybe they don't coincide. But if you add to it an integral of omega, this side changes by two, twice the integral of omega, the other side by four times the integral of omega. So there's one choice that makes them equal. Uh, that makes, this becomes an isometry. Let lock time. Um, okay, and for places, okay, I will cheat here given that I'm over time. For places above uh, P, you just use what's in the neuron tape height. Or new not divided three. Uh, the classical neuron tape height is a q-valued uh, metric that's locally constant, very nicely behaved. Uh, so that you you choose choose this. Um, what I would have said if if I had a few more minutes is actually the relationship between uh, these uh, these uh, UVs these. Uh, this, this really is like cheating. But if you're able to compute periodic heights and study the dependence of the periodic height on the choice of uh, the periodic logarithm, you can extract uh, lo local heights away from this. Is also, this also should appear as in the convergence work. Um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. So your construction is different than Coleman's, but the yeah. result is the same, right? Yeah, yeah. So we should we should we write in the paper that like uh, so Coleman's has a construction of periodic green, Green's functions. We yes. show that our log functions are the same thing as Green functions. Like if if you yeah you make the compatible choice, construction of the Green's functions also depend on choosing this auxiliary complementary subset. You have some the same. flexibility uh, of the of the curvature form, even including that the same. Uh, the the okay. choice of curvature form is exactly the same thing as choosing a complementary subspace. There, there oh, isn't I any see. additional flexibility. I see, I see. So, yeah. But, you, but uh, the function space you construct more explicitly, right? More explicitly. And the real goal is like, uh, I mean, use, okay, I, I didn't get to say this at all, but like this this expression, um, if, you study, if you study how the local height, these periodic iterated integrals, how they, um, how they depend on the choice of the logarithm. So if you, if, you, if you put log P as a formal parameter and you study the dependence, the coefficient of the linear term, this, this picks out the neuron date height. Um, but you can, uh, you can use this to write down um, explicit formulas. At the end of the day, if I had to give a slogan for my talk, it's that one curvature form. The curvature forms rule them all. If you know the curvature forms, you can compute basically everything. So these uh, local heights away from P, they factor through the reduction graph. You can think of this as a function on the reduction graph. And there's an explicit formula for the graph theoretic Laplacian of this, uh, of this function on the reduction graph that you can describe in terms of uh, the things that show up in the curvature form. So you need to understand the residues of these differential forms along along annuli along the edges of of uh, uh, of your dual graph, and you need to know the difference in the Wologotsky integral on the two sides of, of the annulus. So there's a very explicit. You can take this relation and turn it into some explicit formula. We haven't done examples yet, but that's the goal. That's what we're working towards uh, to try and use this to compute uh, local heights away from P in, in more situations. And what is the shape of your person? Uh, you have a finite set T of yes. values. Yeah. What is the shape of this set? Uh, it's the sum of the local heights away from P. I don't know if I can give you a more satisfying answer. Like for e, for if you fix a place away from P, there's just, one for each uh, it's potential. It's a linear combination of yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, study the difference global height minus the local height at P by the construction of which I just raised is the sum of all heights and let's say 
is the sum of all heights uh, away from P. And each of these, uh, the, uh, okay, this is very, sorry, thank you very much for the question. This is where you use the assumption that the line bundle pulls back to the trivial bundle on the curve. Mm -hmm. So for the trivial bundle, the local heights away from P factor through the reduction curve. So I have to start out back to the trivial bundle means that these local heights factor the reduction graph. So there's potentially one, so almost every place where you have places of good reduction, this, these heights are normalized at, at the local height is identically zero. At places of bad reduction, potentially there's one value for each component. It only depends on which component your rational point is. Any other questions? Okay, if you have no questions, let's find the speaker again.